let out of bondage the night of the Passover. And what do you think of every time you think of the Passover? What's the one aspect of the Passover that you think of? I, I don't know about you, but for me, it's the lamb. The Passover lamb that dies that night. And that was a foreshadowing, of course, of Jesus, our Savior. Our Redeemer lives, but he's also one who was pictured as a lamb that was slain. And yet he lives today. And that's what Hezekiah and his people were remembering when they reinstated the Passover. But it wasn't just that they reinstated worship and they reinstated the Passover. They also did away with the idols. If you look in chapter 31, you can see in the first part of chapter 31, it says, When all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah, broke down the pillars in pieces, and cut down the Asherim, and pulled down the high places and the altars throughout all Judah and Benjamin, as well as in Ephraim and Manasseh, until they had destroyed them all. Then all the sons of Israel returned to their cities, each to his possession. This is marvelous because what we're seeing is that Hezekiah took the lead. He was the king at 25 years of age. And he begins a reestablishment of the ways of God and the people fall in with him. It's almost as if they've become sick and tired of their faithless, godless, heathen ways. And they've said, Let, yes, we've got a king who believes in God. Let's rally behind him and, and let's go. And so it wasn't the king who had to go out and destroy these idols. It was the people who went out to all the cities of Judah. And they destroyed these idols that had been standing between them and God for so many years. This is the kind of king that Hezekiah was. And these are the kinds of things that typify his reign. When you get down to the end of chapter 31, 2 Chronicles chapter 31, we read this in verses 20 and 21 and, and following into chapter 32. It says, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good, right, and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God, in the law, and in the commandments seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. After these acts of faithfulness, these were acts of faithfulness. It says, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and besieged the fortified cities and thought to break into them for himself. Now stop for just a minute. And think about what's happening now as people of the world might think or people with fleshly minds might think. And we're trying not to be people of fleshly minds, are we not? Trying to be people with spiritual minds. You've set out to serve God. And you've gone to great lengths to do the things that you believe would be pleasing in, to God. And after all these things have been done and you've had great success returning to God, hardship comes your way. The king of Assyria is now attacked and he's besieging all the cities of Judah. And we might be tempted to think, oh, how can God be displeased with me? Now if that was something that Hezekiah had presumed at that point, would he have been right or would he have been wrong? Well, he would have been wrong to think that God was displeased with him. Bad things happen to us when God's very pleased with our behavior. All you have to do is read the book of Job. Marvelous that God, in his genius providence, and I, I can't even say genius providence because you, the only way you can talk about somebody being a genius is comparing them with the wisdom of someone who's not a genius. And God's wisdom is incomparable. There is no one with whom he can be compared to say that he's a genius or, or whatever. He, he's all-knowing. Not even a genius is all-knowing. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said, let's put a book in there about a man who suffered and suffered horribly because he was righteous. And that way, everybody who lives through life doing their best to be righteous, when they come into times of pain and suffering and difficulty, they can go, I remember I read Job and understand this doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a bad person because I'm suffering bad things. And so here we have Hezekiah. Done everything he can to serve the Lord and now hard times are coming because the king of Assyria has attacked and besieged all his cities. Well, look at verse 6. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 6. He appointed military officers over the people and gathered them to him in the square at the city gate and spoke encouragingly to them, saying... Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of all the horde that is with him. 
For the one with us is greater than the one with him. You talk about a young man with spiritual insight, with, with an integrity that enveloped and included courage. This, this was the young man. He said in verse 8, With him, with Sennacherib, with the king of Assyria, with the king of the most powerful nation at that present time, is only an arm of flesh. But with us, with little Israel, and not even all Israel, because the ten northern tribes had been taken off into captivity, they're gone. This is just the southern tribes. They called them Judah. Little Judah, whose cities have already been besieged by this king, he says, with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And then it says in the last part of verse 8, it's beautiful. And the people relied on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. This king, with a mind towards God, steps out to lead. And he finds that people seem not only willing, but desirous of a strong spiritual leader. And they follow him, and they help him in all of his uh, reinstatements of spiritual practices and spiritual values and when he speaks to them and says don't be afraid they rely on his words marvelous exhortation but Sennacherib was still there Sennacherib threatened Israel and so Israel had to respond Hezekiah had to respond. And for that response, I want you to go to Isaiah. Isaiah, we'll pick up the narrative here in Isaiah chapter 36. Where the chapter starts, Isaiah 36. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. And the king sent messengers. The king sent messengers to Hezekiah and said, Don't trust in Egypt, don't trust in your God, don't trust in anybody, because I'm going to come and wipe you out. In chapter 37, verse 1, it says, Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he entered the house of the Lord. When you fall on hard times, who do you turn to first? Oh, wait a minute, let me rephrase that. When we fall on hard times, who should we turn to first? We should turn to God. I, I know, I've said it, and I've heard other people say it, and as soon as we say it, we make correction. It's like something bad happens, and there's nothing we can do. It's out of our control. Uh, and then we say something like, well, at least we can pray. Have you ever said that? And caught yourself at the same, at least? At least? Is that really the way to think about prayer? It's like, well, if I could do something, I'd do it, but I can't, so I'll just pray. It's like the proverbial uh, Hail Mary in football. We're going to lose this game, so I'm just going to back up and throw it, and I hope somebody from our team catches it in the end zone. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Hezekiah had trouble, so where'd he go? He went to God. He went immediately to God, the one he'd been seeking the whole time, the one he'd been serving the whole time. He goes to God, and when he's in the house of the Lord, he says, we've got a prophet of God, his name is Isaiah, I need to send word to him. So he sends word to Isaiah, and Isaiah sends word back to him. This is in verse 6, chapter 37 of Isaiah, verse 6. Isaiah says to the servants that Hezekiah sent to him, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. God took this personally. And it was a personal affront. The Rabshika had even claimed that God had sent them there to take Judah. And so God tells Hezekiah, Don't be afraid. Now, do you remember... The word horde being used. <laughs> what is a horde? That's a lot. 
That's a bunch. Reminds me of a joke back uh, when President Bush was, was serving. I thought he did a great job, by the way, so this isn't a knock on President Bush. But th th there was a joke going around saying that, that five Brazilian soldiers had been killed in some NATO thing. And he got one of his aides aside and, and said, oh my goodness, that's horrible. How many is there in a Brazilian? Now the ones that are laughing get it. <laughs> and I, oh, okay, that's, that's funny. You know, make a little fun of, of President Bush. The guy was a lot smarter than I think people gave him credit for. Uh, and interestingly enough, I think President Obama is a lot smarter than people give him credit for, just not the right way. All right, I don't want to make this into a political speech. But at any rate, he's got a horde. Judah doesn't have a horde. They don't have a huge army. And so Hezekiah knows, hey, things don't look good if we look at it from a physical standpoint. But we don't want to look at it from a physical standpoint. We want to look at it from a spiritual standpoint. So let's go to God. Let's go to Isaiah, God's man. And Isaiah, God's man, says, don't be afraid. It says in verse 7, I'm going to put a spirit in him in Sennacherib so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Then Rabshakeh, now the Rabshakeh, that's the guy, that's, that's not a name, but that's more of a title. But the Rabshakeh that King Sennacherib had sent, the king of Assyria had sent, returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. And when he heard them say concerning Cherhaka, king of Cush, he's come out to fight against you. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, now what's happening here is, this Rabshakeh has come and he's delivered the message to Isaiah that, or to, uh, to Hezekiah, that the king of Assyria is going to wipe you out. So you better just capitulate, save your hide. Hezekiah goes to God. God says, don't worry about him. I'm going to have him hear a rumor. And the king of Assyria is going to return to his own land. So the, the Rabshakeh goes back and he finds out that what Isaiah predicted has come true. That his king, that's supposed to be going out and fighting against Judah, who he just went out and threatened, his king is going back to take care of some business at home. And he says, wait a minute. Hezekiah is going to think he's off the hook now, so I've got to write another letter and make sure he knows he's not off the hook. So he writes this letter, and he sends messengers to Hezekiah in verse 9. And this was his letter. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 10. It says, Thus you shall say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them completely. So will you be spared? Did the gods of those nations which my fathers have destroyed deliver them, even Gozan and Haran and Rezeph with the sons of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the city of the city, or the king of the city of Sepharvaim and of Hena and Eva? What's he doing? He's saying, we've succeeded against all these other kings, so you know we're going to succeed against you. Don't you let your God deceive you into trusting in him. Now, what's the difference between Hezekiah and all the kings that the Reb Shekha has just listed? They didn't trust in the true and living Almighty God. They trusted in their own gods. They trusted in the same kinds of gods that Hezekiah and his people had been destroying in their restoration of what was right. Verse 14. It says, Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers, and he read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord. He's back up to the house of God. But this time he's got a letter in hand from the Rabshakeh who's threatening him again. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel who is enthroned above the cherubim. You are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to all the words of Sennacherib who sent them to reproach the living God. Truly, the Lord, the kings of Assyria, or truly, O oh Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries and their lands. They've cast out their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, so they have destroyed them. Now, O oh Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. <coughs> I 
You ever had a letter like that? A letter that you wanted God to see the contents of it? I have to wonder down through the years how many people have received letters that had messages that were not very pleasant. People used to be notified by telegram when a family member was killed in the service. Sometimes it wouldn't be a telegram, it'd just be somebody knocking on your door. And the police have had to deliver those kinds of, of messages. Or you go to see a doctor and you talk to the doctor and you think maybe everything's okay, it's not going to be so bad, and the doctor says that you need to meet me with me in the counseling room. And he sits down with you in the counseling room and he's got some, he's got some news that's not very pleasant. It happens, does it not? It's probably happened to a lot of us. What do you do? Well, I think we ought to do what Hezekiah did. You take that letter, you take that message, you take that news, and you spread it out before the Lord. Say, Lord, I need your help. Hezekiah did not dictate to God what he thought God ought to do. Isn't that wonderful? He just spread that letter out and said, Lord, I need your help. He probably didn't know what to do. By the way, do you know what God's going to do? Have you read this? This night, one angel is going to be sent from heaven. That one angel will go through the camp of the Assyrians and 185,000 of them will die. King Sennacherib will wake up the next morning and his army will be gone, dead. What will he do? He'll return home. When he returns home, what will happen? One of his family members will kill him. You don't mess with God. <laughs> you pray to God. You worship God. You serve God. Because God is always right and is always just. And when he killed 185,000 Assyrians that night, there was no injustice done. When Sennacherib died, there was no injustice done. God served Hezekiah as Hezekiah had served him. When you get a letter like that, you get news like that, spread it out before the Lord. Tell the Lord. Let him take care of what's going on. In chapter 38, close on and involved with the same situation, it says, in those, in those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah, the prophet of the son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Isaiah tells him that. You're going to die, you're not going to live. Hezekiah turns his face to the wall, and he prayed to the Lord. And he said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the Lord, word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. 15 years. What else? Verse 6. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Assyria was still causing problems. God says, Not only am I going to deliver you from the Assyrians, I'm going to give you 15 more years of life. How'd you like to be guaranteed 15 more years? Good years. I don't think God gave him bad years. I don't think God gave him sickly years. I think God gave him good years. 15 years, guaranteed. Why? Because Hezekiah prayed. Was Hezekiah a better man than you and I are, men and women? Stronger, perhaps, more faithful? I don't think so. I like what James said. And he said it of Elijah. He said, Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, and yet when he prayed, what happened when he prayed according to James and according to the record in Kings? It didn't pray for three, or it didn't rain for three years. And then has, uh, Elijah prayed again, and it rained. God listened to Elijah. God listened to Hezekiah. Why is this stuff in here if the message is not that God's going to listen to us? If the message is not that God's going to hear us and pay attention to us and care about us, then there's no point in having this in here as far as I'm concerned. Can you see any point if that's not the lesson? Question is, are we praying? 
Are we talking to God? Are you spreading out your letters before him? Are you taking your bad news to him? Are you in communication with him on a regular basis? Years ago, I saw a poem, and I thought, boy, this poem would be so appropriate for this lesson. And I'm almost certain that I have read this in a lesson before, but if you have not heard it, you need to hear this because it just, it's, it's got a lesson in it so great. It's called the Cowboy's Prayer. Anybody heard the Cowboy's Prayer? If you, if you have, just keep your mouth shut, and we'll hear it again. It says, Jake the Rancher went out one day to fix a distant fence. The wind was cold and gusty, and the clouds rolled gray and dense. As he pounded the last staples in and gathered tools to go, the temperature had fallen and the snow began to blow. When he finally reached his pickup, he felt a heavy heart. From the sound of that ignition, he knew it wouldn't start. So Jake did what, did what we'd have done had we been there right there. He humbly bowed his balding head and sent aloft a prayer. He turned the key for one last time and softly cursed his luck. They found him three days later frozen stiff in that old truck. Now Jake had been around a while and done his share of Roman, and he was shocked when he saw heaven, though, because it looked just like Wyoming. Of all the saints in heaven, his favorite was St. Peter. And the next words, they ain't needed, but they help with rhyme and meter. So they sat and talked a spell or two, or maybe it was three. Nobody was a keeping score, and heaven time is free. I've always heard, Jake said to Pete, that God will answer prayer. But one time when I asked for help, well, he just wasn't there. Does God answer prayers of some and ignore the prayers of others? That don't seem exactly square. I know all men are brothers. Does he randomly reply with good, without good rhyme or reason? Maybe it's the time of day, the weather, or the season. Now, I ain't being disrespectful. It's just the way I feel. And I was wondering, could you tell me, what's the deal? Peter listened patiently, and when old Jake was done... There were smiles of recognition, and he said, So you're the one. That day your truck just wouldn't start, and you sent a prayer a-flying. You gave us all a real bad time, with hundreds of us a-trying. A thousand angels rushed to check the status of your file. But you know, Jake, we hadn't heard from you in quite a little while. And though all prayers are answered, and God ain't got no quota, he didn't recognize your voice and cranked a truck in South Dakota. <laughs> I just think that's, that's a great poem. Not because it's funny. It's a little bit long, but it's funny, but it's got a point. And by the way, the point is not that there's some of us that God doesn't know. The point is, keep your communication with God alive. Keep it active. When something happens and you want to go to God and talk about it, it, it shouldn't start with, Lord, you know you haven't heard from me in a while. We ought to be going to God on such a regular basis that, that we don't even think about it. We, we just do it naturally. It's like breathing. It's like opening your eyes in the morning to see. It's just such a part of our existence, or rather it should just be such a part of our existence. And we can see how it worked in Hezekiah's life for the great things, for gaining freedom from fear and oppression from Sennacherib and the Assyrians, for gaining even 15 more years of life when, when you're sick and you're about to die. But what about sharing with God and asking God to share in our lives in all the little things? I don't know about you, but whoever had the idea of putting those desert willows in those islands out there, that's a great idea. Did anybody walk past those this summer and smell them? Anybody? Those are some fantastic smelling trees. I, I don't know what gives them that aroma, but it's a marvelous aroma. And i got to tell you, uh, I'm not trying to tell you how spiritual I am or anything like that. But when I walked past those trees and smelled that aroma, it made me think of God. And I thought, well, who makes trees smell like that but God? And so I thank God for the way those trees smell. And I thank God that there's somebody in this congregation with enough knowledge to say, let's put those trees out. That's just a tiny little small thing. But how many tiny little small things are there in our lives on a daily basis? Do you have a comfortable house? Are you going to go home tonight to a refrigerator with some food in it 
And I know you might be thinking, well, it's cold in the refrigerator. How many of you have a microwave? Put that food in a, in a microwave oven? Can you imagine explaining a microwave oven to the pilgrims? You get lonely? Get on the internet. Get on Facebook. Pick up your phone. Turn on your TV. Turn on your radio. I mean, we've got all kinds of means of communication. We've got so many marvelous gadgets in our culture these days. And just think about what we have just with this group gathered here tonight. The saints, being part of the kingdom of God, being part of a holy assembly that isn't just limited to, to us here in Choctaw, but we are spread all over the globe. And not only in this day and age, but all those who have ever lived to be saints, we are a part of that as well. We're part of so many marvelous things and we enjoy so many marvelous things that when could there ever be a time that we would ever say, I don't really have anything I want to talk to the Lord about right now. If our eyes are open, we ought to be just so filled up with things we want to talk to the Lord about that we just never stop praying. And then we'll close with one passage from the Apostle Peter. I think Peter knew how to pray. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Peter says, and think about Hezekiah when he says this, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Does God care for you? You know he does. How much does he care? You can't measure it. What's he care about? Everything. You care about your children, you care about your grandchildren. If you've got children and grandchildren, you have some idea how much God cares. I remember my mom told me, son, you'll never know how much I love you until you have children of your own. And I always knew academically, intellectually that was true, but I couldn't have known how true it was until we had our first child. Our first child just turned 30. I'm old. And I find myself talking a little bit more to God perhaps now than I did before because I'm getting closer to being with him because I'm getting older. But not just that, it's also because the longer I live, the more things I find I need to talk to him about. How about you? Isn't it fantastic that with even the slightest thought, you can be in the presence of the one who spoke the universe into existence? And he's listening to you, waiting for you, hoping even, hoping for you to come to him. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement and invitation. If you're not part of the kingdom, oh, the Lord knows you need to be. And so we're going to sing this song for you. If you need the prayers of this congregation for any reason whatsoever, we want to pray with you and for you. And we know that that's what the Lord wants. So if you need to respond by coming forward during the singing of this song, come on down. We've got lots of room down front. Let's stand and sing.